A hundred years ago, long before television and mass tourism, there was only one way to see the world. Huge fairs were staged in every great city, bringing the world to the public. From Italian gondolas to African elephants. But it wasn't just animals and objects that were exhibited. Live human beings were put on display. These were human zoos. The St. Louis World's Fair might actually be best known for the 1944 musical in which Judy Garland, like nearly everyone else in the city, is excited about the coming extravaganza. St. Louis's Louisiana Purchase Exposition wasn't the first World's Fair. Philadelphia, Chicago, and Buffalo had all hosted successful expositions. But in 1904, St. Louis was determined to outdo them all. In 1904, the anthropologist William McGee was putting the finishing touches to his human zoo. It was designed to be one of the largest scientific experiments ever undertaken. But before it had even begun, McGee was sure of the conclusion. It was designed to prove to the public that there was a hierarchy of races, with the white man at the top and everyone else beneath. The average white man is stronger of limb, fleeter of foot, clearer of eye, than the average yellow or red or black. Human zoos taught the public that racism was scientific. This new science of race would inspire and feed the ideology of the Nazis. Because they were so different to whites, McGee believed that pygmies were a living, missing link between apes and humans, the lowest rung of the evolutionary ladder. McGee's human zoo was to be the centerpiece of a giant international exhibition, the St. Louis World's Fair. Since 1851, World Fairs had been held across the globe to celebrate human progress. They showed off the latest in culture and new inventions. In St. Louis, the first ice cream cone and Dr. Pepper soft drink were unveiled to the world. The fair would last seven months, but today there's almost no trace left of this extravaganza. What the ideology of the 1904 St. Louis Fair was attempting to do was to exhibit the Filipinos as um, contained tableaus of American colonial um, liberation. So you had an Igret village, and you had a Visayan village, and you had a uh, Moro village, and you had representatives of these different groups, both the quote-unquote civilized Filipinos, who are represented mainly by the Visayans, uh, and the so-called wild tribes. And these were the headhunters, and these were the dog eaters, and these were the people who had bare-breasted women, where the men wore G-strings, and wild dances, and uh, ritual killings, and a lot of the, the kind of orientalist exoticism to titillate the American audiences. The implicit argument of the Philippine Reservation was here you have these wild tribes and under American colonial tutelage through Americanization the wild tribes can move up to the status of these so-called civilized Filipinos and then we can move the whole kit and caboodle closer to being like us, like Americans. But the other purpose of the Philippine Reservation is for the Filipinos to see how big and how powerful and how populated the United States was and to carry back with them to the Philippines the message, you know, we might as well give up this whole Filipino-American war thing because we're never going to win against the Americans. They're too big, they're too prosperous, they're too populated. They are just bigger in every sense of the word than we are and we might as well just give up and become the kind of cooperative little brown brothers. On the orders of General Jacob Smith, U.S. troops retaliated against the entire island of Samar, where Balangiga is located. I want no prisoners. I want all persons killed who are capable of bearing arms against the United States.
have sacrificed nearly 10,000 American lives. You have slain uncounted thousands of the people you desired to benefit. You have established reconcentration camps. Your statesmanship has succeeded in converting a grateful people into enemies possessed of a hatred which centuries cannot eradicate. I have tried to avoid armed conflict in my endeavors to assure our independence. But my efforts have been useless against the American government. The people are strong when they wish to be so. Without arms, we have driven the Spanish from our shores. And without arms, we can repulse this foreign invasion. Teddy Roosevelt officially declares the Philippine-American War over on July 4, 1902. Not because the hostilities in the Philippines had actually concluded, but pretty much because the Americans at home didn't support the war anymore and they just wanted to be out of it. America's military action provokes immediate and sharp debate across the nation. We protest, forcing our system of government upon an unwilling people. We protest the maintenance of a large standing army. We urge working men to awake and call upon their representatives to save them from the dangers of imperialism. The colored people of Boston into their solemn protest against the unjustified invasion by American soldiers in the Philippine Islands, while rights of colored citizens in the South are shamefully disregarded and lynchings frequent, it is the duty of the president to reform these domestic wrongs and not to attempt to civilize alien peoples by powder and shot. They need us to develop them. Uh, look at how they dress themselves. Look at how they dance. Just look at how they live. At the World's Fair, the Eagle Road quickly became one of the more celebrated groups, drawing huge crowds in large part because of one of their customs, eating dog. Four years ago, when sixth graders at Wydown Middle School in suburban St. Louis began wondering why their school's mascot used to be something called an Igorot. They soon learned what an Igorot was and that their school was built on land where the Igorot World's Fair exhibit once stood. Using the internet, the students contacted an Igorot group and in 2000 helped arrange a cultural exchange. Their social studies teacher, Margie Kent, says they hoped in some way they could make amends for what they felt was the Igorot's mistreatment. The more we studied, the more we learned, the more my students began to feel guilty in a sense of shame for what had happened a hundred years ago, even though they had no part in that. And they felt the first thing that they needed to do for the Igo Ropes when they came was to offer them a public apology. While the problem with the success of the Philippine Reservation at the St. Louis World's Fair is that thousands and thousands of Americans who came to see the Philippine exhibition came away with a memory of Filipinos as being small, dark, naked, and savage, basically. This was the reality show of its time. This is the real deal. But by the time the fair closed in December 1904 and the savages were on their way home, 20 million people had passed through its gates and most went away believing that anthropology had publicly demonstrated that the white race was superior. For them, racism had been given a scientific seal of approval. And scientific racism was now set to change the course of the 20th century. Compare, the organizers said, all that we have done with the primitive, the backward, the unclothed, whose villages we have transported to these fairgrounds. Later generations would find their displays insensitive, their social science flawed. But those who staged them were unapologetic in their sense of cultural and racial superiority. 